free training provided by the HVAC School Podcast is made possible because of the generous support from our sponsors, Testo, Rector Seal, and Carrier. Meet ZoomLock, the 10-second flame-free refrigerant fitting from Parker. Reduce labor costs by 60% with no brazing, no flame, and no fire spotter. Discover how ZoomLock can help you be more efficient and productive. Visit ZoomLock.com for more information. Allow me to introduce the guy who actually says, actually, after every word, actually, Brian R. All right, thanks for listening. This is the HVAC School Podcast, the podcast that reminds you of all the things you might have forgotten about the HVACR industry or reminds you of some things you forgot to know in the first place. I am Brian, and today on the podcast, I'm talking with my service manager, service manager of Kalo Services, the company that I own and started, about ductless maintenance. So we're going to go over kind of step-by-step what we do. You're probably going to hear some things that you may not agree with, and I'm open to hearing your feedback on things that you do in addition or things that you don't like that we do. And so I'll just put it right out there in the front. You can reach me at Brian, B-R-Y-A-N, at HVACRschool.com. That's Brian at HVACRschool.com. Brian is with a Y. R is for radical or refrigeration. And you can also find out all of all our daily tech tips and all of our resources and podcasts and all that stuff you can find at HVACRschool.com. I try to put out something daily. Sometimes I miss a day here or there. And actually, I'm currently, when you're hearing this, I'm on vacation right now, but I'm still producing content, putting it out there in the world. And so uh, here we go. This is actually going to be a two-part series, but this is part one, Duckless Maintenance with Jesse Clutterbout. All right, so I'm talking with Jesse, who is the service manager of our company, Kalo Services. And we're going to talk today about duckless maintenance. We do a lot of work in the villages, which is a retirement community northwest of Orlando. And in that community, there's a big demand for duckless systems, primarily for sunrooms. But then also there's some other applications as well that we've installed them in. So because of that, we've done a lot of installations. If you go back in the archives, you'll find a duckless installation episode. And then this episode, we're going to focus on duckless maintenance because we do a boatload of duckless maintenance. And there are some unique things that are specific to duckless. First of all, if you're going to do a good ductless maintenance, it's probably going to take a little longer than a typical AC maintenance is what we found. So we've gotten a lot of questions about ductless maintenance. And so we're just going to go through step-by-step things that we look for and things that we do and how we handle ductless maintenance. So first off, thanks for being willing to sit down out of your busy schedule, Jesse. Absolutely. I'm glad to be here today. I hope we cover a lot of issues that we as a company have found out and dealt with over the years Because we do so many of these, you have to come up with a solution to all of those problems. Otherwise, it's a reoccurring issue. Whereas if you don't do a lot of these maintenances or you're going to be doing a lot of these maintenances for the next couple of years, having this information that we're going to go over today could really benefit you guys. So hopefully it does. If it doesn't, just enjoy listening. (laughs) Yeah. So let's start with ductless systems. We primarily install heat pumps, so they have to be running both cooling and heating seasons. And so we recommend to our customers that they do a twice a year maintenance like any other system. But the one thing that we find with ductless systems is that they do require a lot of cleaning, like more cleaning than a typical unit. So let's start with the basics of the air filter. Obviously, most of us know this, but what's the practice there? The air filter, it's a little plastic filter. It's a washable filter. Honestly, they don't catch a lot of the finer particles of dust, so they tend to catch the bigger stuff, so they don't get dirty as quickly as you would expect. So every couple of months is when they need to be cleaned out, two or three months. And at that point, they do have a coating on it, so you just want to wash them out with a hose or utility sink. Or I've had a couple customers who just vacuum them off. Again, they're not high MERV, so they don't catch a lot of the smaller particles. So that's pretty much all it is with the filters, how they should be cleaned. So just like a lot of times on mine, because I've had ductless systems for the last several years, when I maintain mine, I just take them into the kitchen sink with the sprayer and just, just spray them off and let them dry and reinstall them. What do you generally suggest to customers? Yeah, I suggest either utility sink or the hose. That's my favorite thing with no cleaners. So that's the big thing I stress because you can see the customers that use bleach or other chemicals that tend to break down the film that's on it and then dust starts to get stuck inside of it kind of like a hog's hair filter if you will whereas the coating you just spray it off with the hose and everything comes off really cleanly yeah there's not really anything necessary to to do advanced i've heard some people say put it in the dishwasher 
I don't think I would probably recommend that. I mean, unless the manufacturer's information says that. It you, does not. Right. <laughs> Which I haven't seen that, but unless someone saw that, I, I wouldn't recommend it. Because again, what I tend to see with them is that the actual filter itself starts to break down or starts to tear. Or it just the integrity of the actual fibers begin to break down a little bit. And you just don't need to do anything fancy with that. Just take it out, wash it, which I know is fairly obvious, but just to reinforce that. The other thing I would add to that is a lot of times customers will say, well, do I need to let it dry first? No, you can spray it off, shake it out, put it back in. It's fine. The air is going to pull it in. Anything that drips is going to fall on that EVAP coil into the drain pan. So it's, it's not a big deal. On those filters, though, just for you and your technicians and the homeowners, if you're like smacking them on concrete, trying to get every last little droplet off, you do run the risk of actually breaking the frame. There's a little plastic frame on the outer edges. So don't do that, obviously. A lot of cases I would actually take them outside if I was going to wash them out with a hose as part of a maintenance. Because when you're dealing with ductless, you generally have a regular unitary system on the house as well. So I've just kind of like held them over the condenser of the main unit in the house and just kind of held it there and and let it blow off some of the moisture. And the point is just so it's not going to drip on anything because a little bit of moisture left on it's not going to hurt anything. I mean, there are some people who swear by them needing to be dry, but I don't see any real good reason why. The only thing that I try to dry them off enough for is so when I bring them back in, you don't get a drip, drip, drip trail. That's the only reason I even care about drying them off at all. All right, so the next thing is blower wheels. And I put blower wheels even before evaporator coils because of how often that becomes an issue on ductless. So let's go through the process, what you recommend on blower wheels, and not just how to clean it, but what the recommended schedule is of cleaning blower wheels. So this is definitely one of the bigger challenges that we have come across. So years ago, we started installing 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 of these a year. And lo and behold, we do the maintenance on those. Before we were doing this quantity of them, during our regular preventative maintenance, we would pull and clean the blower wheel as needed. What we found is that that's very time consuming. You have to train every individual technician on how to do that. It's not like a normal blower wheel. It's not just two screws, slides out, unplug the power going to the blower motor. It's not like that, it's more involved. So a huge thing we found is, one, it's extensive labor. And what costs a company a lot of money is man hours. We're spending all this man hours on the work that we're performing, which is great quality work, but you're not getting paid for it. You're not factoring that into a normal maintenance that should take from 45 minutes to an hour and a half. Because keep in mind, at that time, we were charging $79 for our standard maintenance. And if you're going to be there for two hours, you're going to lose your rear end. Correct. Now, we have a price for a blower pull and clean. Now, a challenge that we face is now we have all these customers that are not educated on a ductless maintenance. And to pay an additional $150, $160, whatever it may be, to spend an extra hour to an hour and a half to remove and clean the blower wheel can be problematic. You literally have to educate your technicians, the guys in the field, on how to appropriately educate the customer so that way they understand the additional labor and cost it is for you as a company to be able to provide the appropriate service and preventative maintenance on that system. Yep, absolutely. So let's talk through on the actual removing and cleaning of a blower wheel. And most of the systems we have installed are either Carrier or Mitsubishi. We're starting to do more Carrier now. Carrier's talked about a new model that they're going to have just two screws and you can pull the whole blower assembly out. It is actually out now. So their performance series, it's actually on their new models that are in their warehouses right now. So I'm excited about that. It's going to make the process of removing and cleaning that blower wheel much easier. So I guess the first thing to mention is why it happens, which we don't always know exactly why, but you have these long blower wheels that have very, very small cups in them. And so anything that gets in them really reduces the airflow. And they also tend to build up an electrostatic charge. It seems like what we've seen in the past is if you ever have a case where the penetration through the wall is not completely, perfectly hermetically sealed, and you're able to draw in moisture through the back of the unit, that tends to make it worse. But it has a lot to do with the space, how the customer operates the space. Those blower wheels, because they're not metallic, they do build up like a static charge and they just kind of catch everything that makes it through. Yeah, when they're 
obviously the blower wheel, the more hours the system runs, the dirty it's gonna get. The higher the speed that the blower runs, not necessarily. It's not necessarily the CFM that it moves, because I have a lot of customers that actually put it in that quiet or low mode and it seems like the temperature split across the coil is now colder, which creates a little bit more of a dew point on that wheel, which can actually cause it to get dirtier. I'm not sure exactly how that works out, but I went to one last week where there was probably a one inch hole in the drywall going up into the attic right above the unit, kind of tucked in there. He had previously had some electrical coming down and it had only been installed a year and this thing was bad. It was just hardly moving any air. So then at that point, you have to sit down and take five, 10 minutes to educate the customer on the process, why it's doing this, how often this has to be done, the additional labor involved, and then move forward from there. And seal up the hole too. Right, that's a no brainer. Right. So, well, yeah, sorry, gosh. Sorry to ask you to say a stupid thing, Jesse. Jeez. Yeah. He gets kind of judgy on me sometimes. I don't know where he gets it Yeah, from. so you obviously want to seal up that hole. So we took care of that before we sat down and had the conversation as far as what's causing this, the additional labor involved, and how often does it need to be done? Just like changing a filter when it gets dirty. That's the true answer to that question. When it actually starts to cause any issue with the operation of the system, that's the point at which it needs to be done. And for ductless systems, it's a thing that's missed often. And I don't know about other markets. In our market, we got a lot of junk in the air. We've got very high latent load. So it may be that in other places, ductless systems don't build up as much on the blower wheel. But in our market in Florida, it's really bad. It's pretty extreme, which is why I mention it first. So you have the option of pulling and cleaning the blower. And so let's talk through on a Mitsubishi system, basically what you do and about how long it takes for you. And Jesse's done a lot of these. So obviously it's easier for him than most people. Yeah. So I've done a lot of ductless preventative maintenance as well as removing and cleaning the blower wheel. So on the Mitsubishi product, obviously you take off the top plate. That's the cover for the filters, remove the filters. One thing I've seen a lot of times is you have four clips in the back. So on the upper back portion that the front plate actually clips in. So you're gonna remove that filter door cover that just pulls out, remove the two filters. You'll either have two or three screws on the lower portion. So take those out. Then that bottom part just kind of pops out. And here, the whole process, what we're doing right now is actually removing that front cover on the unit. What I've seen is a lot of times the units are so close to the ceiling that you can't actually get your hand back on top of the unit to push down on the tabs and actually remove that front plate. So why I remove that front cover and the filters is you can actually stick your hand up through the front where the coil is and push down on that body and release those four latches on the backhand side. Because if there's an inch or two, you can't actually reach back in there and push down where you need to on those tabs. That's a cool little trick that. I mean, in general, you don't want them that close to the ceiling, but there are some applications. In some cases, you're going on headers that are over windows and things. And so it's just that you got to get it a little tighter to the ceiling. But I get what you're saying, though. So you're just reaching up through the inside and kind of almost flexing the body a little bit in order to get those clips to release. Yeah. Usually you'll have one on the right, one on the left. Usually you can get your hand from the outside, no problem. But then they have two on the inner portion. So you really have to have your arm all the way up there close to your elbow. So then you need three inches of clearance and you don't have that on every unit. Anyways, pull that off. Then at that point, you're gonna have three screws. And here we're referring to the Mitsubishi product right now. They have a lot of units out there. Again, the carriers are gonna be easier because they got the four bolts on the bottom and that whole thing just slides right out. So it's actually a way easier process. But as far as the Mitsubishi goes, and this is pretty much across the board though, they're all very similar to this process, other than the carrier is now easier. So then at that point, you got three screws on the left-hand side, two of them are right there by the blower bearing, and then there's one up that kind of holds the coil in place. Now at this point, all you're looking at is the coil, the blower wheel, and then the back plastic section of the system itself. So then you'll slowly turn the blower wheel itself, and then there's gonna be a slot in the blower wheel itself where there's actually the set screw. So it's enough space. In a lot of cases, it's almost like there's a vein missing a little bit. Then that's where you can get in to get that set screw. Correct. So then you just loosen that up. Biggest thing I'd say on that front is don't loosen up too much. You just have to loosen up two turns maybe. That's all you need. 
And then you have the screws removed on the left-hand side. You're going to lift the coil portion up, remove the bearing, hold the blower wheel in the center of it, kind of lift the coil up, and slide it towards yourself down and to the left. And it'll slide right off the blower shaft. But it takes kind of flexing that coil. Like A lot of guys end up disassembling a lot more than this. And in some cases, the manufacturer's instructions even show that. But this is much easier than disassembling everything. You have to be gentle with it, obviously. you got to know what you're doing, but it saves a lot of time. Testo is celebrating 60 years of high-quality instrumentation with their best-in-class fall combustion analyzer promotion. There's never been a better time to get a high-quality Testo combustion analyzer than right now. This offer is for a free 770-3 meter, the meter we've talked about a lot on this podcast with Bluetooth and direct power reading and inrush amps and many more great features. You can get that meter for free if you purchase the Testo 320 or 330 series of combustion analyzers, or you can get a 745 non-contact voltage sensor if you purchase the Testo 310. This is a limited time offer, and you can find out more by going to hvacrschool.com forward slash fall promo, which will take you to the Testo site where you can get the form to fill out. You do need to hold on to your receipt from whoever you purchased the combustion analyzer from but of course we suggest if you don't have a a local supply house that stocks these you can easily go to truetechtools.com t-r-u tech tools.com and use the offer code get schooled and you'll get an additional eight percent off then just save your receipt that you get from true tech tools go to hvacrschool.com forward slash fall promo and fill out the form and you will get either a free 770-3 meter or a 745 non-contact voltage sensor from testo Testo, 60 years of excellence, perfect for testing, perfect for service. After you get the front cover off, one thing I missed, sorry, is the drain pan. You're going to take that drain pan and pop it out. Um, At that point, it gives you complete access to the drain pan itself, to the drain tube going out, and you're really able to fully clean that out appropriately. Because if you don't do this, then you have a lot of gunk and stuff that can stay in there. And it's a very small drain pan on these systems. So now we got the blower out in our right hand. You're going to take your left hand, kind of position the coil back in the original place. Again, you're only moving this an inch or two out to give it enough room for that blower wheel to come out. So then I take everything outside. You got the veins, you got the front cover, you got the filter, you got the blower wheel all of that goes outside depending on how dirty the blower wheel is you may spray everything down with some cleaner and let it sit for a minute or two and then just hose all of that down once you've hosed everything off you're going to just bring it back inside again you want to dry these off enough where it's not dripping everywhere and especially the blower wheel because it'll fling water all over the place if it's still very correct still What I've found is putting it over the central air conditioning system. That's a great idea. If you have a little blower on your truck, that's a good idea. But there's going to be a little bit of moisture on that wheel when you kick it on for the first time where it slings a little bit of water out. A couple droplets, nothing significant. So that's not like to be unexpected. So if if they have their copy of the Mona Lisa right in front of it, then you would want to take some... uh... Correct. And if you're doing this over carpet for everyone, for Gosh, goodness, darn it, use a drop cloth. There is no way you're going to be able to do this process without getting something on the floor. So if it's not concrete, if it's not tile, if it's not painted concrete, use a drop cloth. Carpet, those sort of things, wood floors, use a drop cloth. Even on the concrete, it's easier if you use a 5x5 drop cloth and just roll it up on the end. It just makes your life so easy. Also, if you drop a screwdriver... With a drop cloth, it's a little bit of protection from maybe scratching the paint on the floor if it is concrete. So use a drop cloth. Then on the evaporator coil itself, so you've done everything on the outside. You've done the covers. You've done the veins. You've done the drain pan. You've done the blower wheel all outside. But you still have that evaporator coil inside. So when do you do that and what do you do with that? So the time that I would recommend doing that is after you've cleaned the blower wheel, cleaned the housing, you got it all leaning up against the house, you can just let it drip dry a little bit. You could bring it in right away, but you got to spend some time cleaning the inside. So just let it drip dry. Lean it up against the house. After you've cleaned these all off, I don't like 
putting it like in dirt or grass because that's going to get on it. But then you have to be very aware not to put it on like concrete where it could scratch the face of it because there's kind of a shine to the front of it. So you want to set it down in such a way where it's not going to roll, it's not going to get scratched. So just be conscious of that. Then at that point, you're going to come in. Spray bottle is what I use. Pump sprayer is okay. Pump sprayer obviously produces more water than a spray bottle. But the downside is, is you sometimes have a hard time managing the water. I mean, my experience has been with a lot of technicians, pump sprayers, they leak. The tips leak. It doesn't shut off all the different connectors leak. And again, they shouldn't, but I've seen this a lot. I had to use one of my tech's spray bottles the other day to clean up a case in a grocery store that I was working on. And it's like I'm trying to manage the water leaking all over the place while I'm doing it. So that's where if you can use a spray bottle, if you don't need that velocity of water, you're going to have better control over the cleaner or water or whatever you're using. That's true. And because of that, let's say use a spray bottle. I mean, the coil is so small. The amount of water and cleaner that you need is so insignificant. Just use a spray bottle. And the other thing about ductless coils is they also tend to be very thin. The fin spacing is super tight. I was going to say that the fin spacing actually seems to be a little bit wider. Does it? Yeah. Within a typical evaporator coil? Mm Mm-hmm. It's because they don't want that static. I mean, you look at them a lot more than I do. Maybe it's because the coil is so small and it looks like a huge gap. (laughs) Right, maybe. We need to take a couple and then take a look at this fin spacing. But anyway, they always seem center to me. But regardless, they're very thin, the actual depth of the coil, because the tubes are very small tubes. Yes. So because of that, you don't need to necessarily have a huge amount of pressure in order to get it cleaned. From there, what are you using? Brushes, rags, anything? At this point, you have the blower out. You got the drain pan down. You have full access to the whole housing underneath the evaporator coil and then the whole top of the evaporator coil. Like everything is exposed at this point. What I've found is even though those filters aren't like a high MERV, it catches all the big stuff. So you really don't get stuff that's compacted in the coil like you would see on a normal residential home where they didn't use a filter. Rarely do you see that. What I tend to see is just a little bit of surface dust, maybe a little growth here or there, uh, just mildew on it. Nothing significant, though. If it's not significant, what I do is just spray everything down. So you're going to spray the face of the coil. That's what's facing you. And then you're going to take your spray bottle and go underneath and actually spray the whole entire housing and then the underside of the evaporator coil. This depends. If it's not too bad, there's just a little bit on it, I'm just going to take my rag. First, I'm just going to wipe off the front face of the coil. Then I'm going to go up underneath and wipe the evaporated coil. Now, this is very gently with the grain. So you're not going left to right. You're going up and down with the grain. Again, this is just to get little stuff off. Now, if it's worse and it seems like there's more on it, I like a little hand broom. It works great. Sweep it with the grain. It works good. And then at the end, just wipe it off with the rag. But I haven't had any issues as far as cleaning the evaporated coils. It's... I've never had an issue. Yeah, and, and it sounds like, so a lot of people hear that like, oh man, you got to get pressure in there or whatever, but we're talking very practically here. You're getting the surface stuff off. Apparently all Jesse's coils are made with wood, so you go with the grain of the wood on the coil. That was a little joke. I got it. Yeah. That you go. Good. You, <laughs> so with the types of cleaners that you use though need to be cleaners that are very mild. They're talking about green type cleaners, cleaners that don't have any, aren't going to add VOCs to the air. I mean, of course, all cleaners are going to add some VOCs to the air, but you want non-toxic cleaners, cleaners generally that don't use things like triclosan or other types of chemicals that could react and give the customer a reaction or anything that could be a corrosive, no brightening cleaners, nothing like that on an evaporator coil. So just mild, mild stuff. So what I would recommend using is a microban. You don't need self-rinse evap coil. You don't need that. It's just not necessary. And this is, again, speaking from years of experience. It's not necessary. So why do it? And what we use is we use Microband makes a product called Botanical Microband. So it's actually a plant-based cleaner. It doesn't have any warnings on it or anything. We've used it for years. And again, small doses, you're not like dousing the thing in it. You're just using it enough to get it clean. Anytime you're putting in, because manufacturers, I'm kind of hedging here a little bit, because manufacturers gripe about putting anything on coils. Right. They're going to get grouchy when you put anything on anything. So if you're in doubt, use water. That's fine. Even, of course, even water has a little bit of chlorine in it. So there's something there. In fact, it's funny. Years ago, we had a customer who kept having odor complaints, and he called Mitsubishi Tech Support, and they told him to spray bleach on his evaporator coil. 
Oh my goodness. Mitsubishi tech support told him to spray bleach and I called him. I'm like, what gives? They're like, ah, just a little bit every now and again won't hurt. And I was thinking, okay, well, I guess that gives me license to use uh, coil cleaners as I need. But anyway, we use um, botanical microban. We buy it from a company called John Don in bulk and we've had no issues with it at all. And we actually started using it because we used a antimicrobial product that had triclos, as some people call it, triclosan. And we had a customer who claimed that she had an allergic reaction to it and had an entire big deal about it. So we started using a fully botanical product that has no warnings on it when we're working on evaporative coils, unless we're removing them. So if we're removing an evaporative coil, and this is true of Unitary or anything, then we could use maybe a little bit stronger cleaner on it, but then we rinse it completely. But if it's going to stay in place, we only use products that don't have any warning labels and nothing that could throw up a red flag with a customer. It's a true story, though. That actually happened, and it was just a rogue uh, tech support person. But no, don't put bleach or any stream cleaners on evap coils of any sort. Thank you for clarifying that, because I wasn't sure what to tell my techs now. Don't do that. If you're going to use a cleaner, use it mild. Don't overthink it. The coils are very thin. Just get them clean. Rag is probably going to be your best tool and maybe a soft bristle brush. The other thing I want to mention, because we're talking about kind of a a way of doing this deep cleaning, but there are kits out there. Erector Seal makes a kit called the Dissolve Kit, which is dissolve without an E at the end of the word dissolve. And it's almost like a big bib that goes underneath the unit. And that way you can get in with a pump sprayer and with some of their dissolve cleaner, which is also a good cleaner specifically for ductless coils. So I think you've tried that, if you wouldn't mind mentioning that. I've had a couple case scenarios where you have to clean the evaporator coil. Um, This particular one in mind, it was at some commercial office and they kept complaining about odors, odors, odors. They're on a maintenance plan. So we're just doing our normal preventative maintenance and it's just not getting it clean enough doing the normal take a spray bottle spray it down with cleaner let it suck out the drain line all of that normal stuff that we do i pulled and cleaned the blower wheel sprayed everything down wiped it down and the results were not good enough like they legitimately weren't like this wasn't a crazy customer that's saying hey it smells bad like it smelled bad so i said well what we can do is we have this great cleaning kit we can hook this up and actually use a pump sprayer with cleaner and actually really jet through that whole evaporator coil and do a thorough cleaning. That'll be X amount of dollars. And they're like, oh, that's kind of expensive. Let me see how it does with what you did. So I was like, okay, not a problem. So they called me back the next day and were like, yeah, it just still stinks. I was like, okay, bummer. I was hoping that would work out for you guys. So then we went back out there and hooked up the kit and used a pump sprayer. On this particular one, because of the issues with smell, we used a self-rinse evaporator coil cleaner. And we just did everything as instructed and just, we probably used four or five gallons of water mixed with evap self-rinse cleaner and just going over that coil. It's amazing. The bib's kind of clear and you see all the dirt coming out. I was really surprised how much actually came out. Because, again, you're looking at the coil, and it doesn't look that bad, but it's actually dumping out all this dirty water, and the kit comes with a bucket where everything's stored inside of it, so that's nice, and then it's at the bottom. So this is all pouring into the bucket. It's like a huge funnel that goes on the ductless system. I'm like, man, this better work. And so after we spray it down, we let it sit, spray it down, let it sit. We do that about three times, and then we rinse. So we went probably through 10 gallons of rinsing. I think we had a three-gallon pump sprayer, so we did it, I think it was three times with just straight water. Now that we've cleaned it, we want to get all the cleaner off of it. So we went through that whole process until the water was coming out crystal clear and put everything back together, and it worked great. I was completely happy with the result as far as you kicked it on. It smelled like a new system. And we were able to rinse it so much that there wasn't even any smell of cleaner left. It was just new. It was a really good experience. And with that case, that's really the only option. I mean, the other thing you could do is actually pump down the system, disconnect the lines, pull it out, remove the evaporator coil. And it took us probably an hour of labor, 45 minutes to an hour, opposed to four or five hours. Yeah. And then, yeah, it's an evacuation and everything else that you have to do. Yeah. So yeah, that's the Rector Seal Dissolve Kit and it comes with the cleaner in the bucket. It comes with the bib in the bucket. It comes with the frame for the bib in the bucket. It drains down into the bucket. So it's kind of like, it's got everything all there. And we haven't started using it exclusively yet, but it's really just a matter of looking at 
a cost, set up time, all those sorts of things. So there's definitely applications where it definitely makes sense. And in that case, with most of these, you have the evaporator coil and the blower compartment is all sealed together. So you can get in there on the blower and everything with that kit. You do have to be careful, though, because you're still carrying a pump sprayer in and out of the house. You're still doing that. And so you still want to be really thoughtful about doing that. And in a lot of cases, we'd just rather still just pull it outside. But it's a really good option in many cases. a good thing to have available to you. The thing I would say is being a technician or a tradesman, it's all about having the right tools for the job. This isn't a pliers. You don't use this on every single job. But when you need this tool, it's a great tool to have. If you did a lot of ductless systems, you could even put a note in the customer's file to say, bring this with you when you do this maintenance or whatever the case may be. And a good thing to have, and that's the Rector Seal Dissolve Kit. Hey, thanks for listening. I want to remind you that HVACR School is part of the Blue Collar Roots Network, which is a network of great podcasts. You can find all of them by going to bluecollarroots.com. One podcast that I really enjoyed is Bill Spohn's podcast, the Building HVAC Science Podcast. He did one on humidity. That was really eye-opening to me. I learned a lot. He had Nate Adams on, and Nate is sort of like a building performance expert up in Ohio. So I would suggest that you go listen to that one on humidity. Bill also did one recently on infrared thermometers. That was good. It had a couple witty lines in there. So uh, check that out. So I was talking to Stephen Raritan about his trip that he took to Africa. And I asked him if he got a chance to play poker while he was out in the savannah. And he said, no, there's too many cheetahs. <laughs> we'll talk next time on HVAC School. Thanks for listening to the HVAC School podcast. You can find more great HVACR education material and subscribe to our short daily tech tips by going to HVACRschool.com. If you enjoy the podcast, would you mind hopping on iTunes or the podcast app and leave us a review? We would really appreciate it. See you next week on the HVAC School Podcast.